uh, showed a lack of uh, discourse and serious exchange of ideas on campus. And what we're going to be doing here today um, is designed to be challenging. It's going to be an exercise in that open discourse. Um, we're going to have first uh, remarks about um, intellectual heterodoxy and then remarks on one specific case study, namely climate change or global warming. Um, I'm going to yield the floor now so we can leave as much time at the end for questions, but first, Professor Kelly, philosophy. <coughs> So thanks. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, thanks to uh, Michael and the Princeton Open Campus Coalition for inviting me to participate. And thanks to the organizers of the event, Ryan and his uh, co-organizers. Okay, so I'm someone who thinks that intellectual diversity, diversity of opinion, for universities is every bit as important as any other kind of diversity. So I think it's crucial at a place for a place like Princeton to provide an environment in which there's plenty of people who hold unpopular opinions, in which it's relatively easy for people who hold unpopular opinions to express those opinions and argue for those opinions. And to the extent it, uh, it gets to the point where it takes a lot of courage to do that, you need to be some kind of moral hero to do that, or something heroic about doing that, I think that's already a problem. Right? Um, I think that's true even if the opinions in question are considered deeply wrong-headed, even immoral, by people who hold the orthodox opinion. And in as much as places like Princeton don't always do such a great job at providing such an environment, which I sometimes suspect is the case, I'll be very interested in hearing other people's opinions about the extent to which that, that's the case in their own experiences, uh, I think that's a bad thing. Right? Now, why do I believe this? Uh, my reasons for believing this aren't things I thought of on my own, they're not original with me, they're things I take myself to have learned from other people. And here, in fact, because I don't have all that much time, I did want to recommend two short, short pieces to you that made a very big impression on me when I first read them and I continue to find worthwhile. The first is, so, the 19th century English philosopher John Stuart Mill wrote a book called On Liberty, and the second chapter of that book is entitled, uh, where is it? Of the Liberty of Thought and Discussion. And so I recommend that. And the second piece is, a short essay by the writer George Orwell, uh, The Freedom of the Press. He originally wrote it as a preface to his novel Animal Farm. And for what it's worth, both of these pieces, if it matters, both these pieces are written by people who were on the political left, right? Both thought of themselves as being on the political left and were considered correctly by their contemporaries to be on the political left. So one of the things that makes the Orwell essay kind of interesting is it contains what I take to be the first, or one of the first, good accounts of what people now call, or in universities, political correctness. So here's Orwell, I'm just going to read this passage to you, describing what he takes to be the condition of the British intellectual class to which he belongs, the British intelligentsia, at the time. At any given moment, there's an orthodoxy, a body of ideas which it is assumed that all right-thinking people will accept without question. It is not exactly forbidden to say this, that, or the other, but it is, quote, not done to say it. Just as in mid-Victorian times, it was not done to mention trousers in the presence of a lady. Anyone who challenges the prevailing orthodoxy finds himself silenced with surprising effectiveness. A genuinely unfashionable opinion is almost never given a fair hearing. Unpopular ideas can be silenced, and inconvenient facts kept dark without the need for any official ban. Okay, now why is that a bad thing? Mill, in the chapter I suggested to you, gives a number of reasons for this. And first, and maybe most obviously, thinks, look, sometimes orthodoxies are wrong. Right? They're just incorrect. And if you don't have an atmosphere or an environment in which people feel free to stand up and challenge the orthodoxy, <laughs> it'll take you a lot longer to discover that or find that out. Right? Sometimes the orthodoxy might be completely wrong. Right? One thing that makes the Orwell essay that I mentioned so poignant, at least to me, is that in hindsight, at least by my lights, the view, the issue that moves Orwell to write is one where he's completely correct, and the people who are giving him a hard time are completely incorrect. So I said he wrote this essay, Freedom of the Press, originally as a preface to his novel Animal Farm, and in it he describes how hard it was for him to get the book in, public, get the book in print, and how, what a hard time people gave him, uh, because they perceive correctly that it's a negative portrayal 
of the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin, right? And so Orwell, I said, he has this view that um, at any given time, the British intellectual class, there's a prevailing orthodoxy, and that changes from time to time. But he says, look, here's what it is right now. At the moment, what is demanded by the prevailing orthodoxy is an uncritical admiration of Soviet Russia. And he says, look, that's not my view. Um, I, I, I insist on my right to say it's, uh, it's not a good thing going on in the Soviet Union. Here's what I went through trying to get this book in print. Okay. So that's a view where, at least if you're like me, you think, look, or Orwell, the person with the heterodox view, was basically completely right, and the people with the orthodox view were completely wrong. Mill says, look, that's an extreme case. I mean, Mill's writing before Orwell, of course, that's enough Orwell in mind. But Mill says, look, that's an extreme case. Occasionally that might happen. But here's something even more common. Sometimes the orthodoxy has part of the truth, right? Even in a case where uh, the orthodoxy is closer to the whole truth than any alternative view, a lot of times it won't have the whole truth. And in some of these cases, even views that are on the whole further from the truth, some heterodox view, alternative view, might be helpful in correcting orthodoxy. Right? And in these circumstances, he thinks, it's important to have outspoken dissenters around because engaging with them helps us improve the received opinion. Okay. And I think that's a genuine and important phenomenon. What about a case in which the opposite extreme, where the orthodoxy is in fact 100% correct, and people of alternative views are 100% wrong. What about that kind of case? Think, surely in that kind of case, um, we don't want to encourage dissenters, because by hypothesis in that kind of case, encouraging dissent is just encouraging error. Right? Now somebody might say, well how could you ever be certain you're in a case where the prevailing opinion is 100% right? So maybe we want to hedge our bets, you know, just because uh, uh, you're not really sure what kind of case you're in. That's not what Mill says. Mill goes further. He suggests, look, even if you were kind of looking down God's eye point of view, and you can just see, look, the orthodoxy is the complete truth, the alternative views are completely wrong, even in that case, there's a value to active, outspoken dissent, right? Even with respect to that particular question. Now, why is that? Here, Mill gives an argument that scholars sometimes call his dead dogma argument. And he goes on about develops this argument at length. I'm just going to summarize for you the conclusion, which also kind of gives you the main idea. Mill says this, even if the received opinion is not only true, but the whole truth, unless it is vigorously and earnestly contested, it will be, by most of those who receive it, held in the manner of a prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling for its rational grounds. And not only this, but the meaning of the doctrine itself will be in danger of being lost or enfeebled. The dogma becomes merely a formal profession. So I read that many years ago. I actually first read this book as uh, first, first semester of freshman year in college, which was a long time ago. I'm not sure how much of an impression it made on me then, but I do think uh, the longer I've been a professor, the more uh, truth I see in Mill's dead dogma argument. For example, when he says, look, um, a substantive view Like a substantive view, even if there really are, uh, if it's never contested, people will inevitably start to hold it in the manner of a prejudice, even if there really are good grounds, good reasons for thinking it's true. Sometimes I have this experience when talking to students or my colleagues, when we're talking about politics, for example, or other things as well, even when it's a view that both of us share, and it might be the person I'm talking to is very intelligent, I've had this experience with people I certainly consider more intelligent than myself, uh, even once a view both of us share, so it's some local orthodoxy that I think is right. I have some orthodox views, in addition to some heterodox views. And I think, look, there really is a strong case to be made for this. But I'm kind of really underwhelmed by the persons, even if they're very smart, very intelligent, very sophisticated, by their grip on the case. And I often get the feeling that what's going on here is the person's grip is weak precisely because this is something that pretty much everyone at Princeton believes even though there are plenty of people outside of Princeton, including intelligent people, who don't believe it. Okay, so there are all sorts of objections to Mill's arguments. I just want to mention one of them that Mill considers, which I think is particularly interesting. He imagines somebody replying to him like this. Look, 
I agree with some of what you're saying. I agree it's very important to always be open and to consider seriously the best case that can be made for alternative heterodox opinions. But, other, you know, otherwise all these bad effects like orthodoxy becoming mere prejudice or dead dogma or something like that. But we don't need actual dissenters around for that. We don't need an environment that encourages or is at least hospitable to actual dissenters. It's enough if we've got really smart people who themselves believe the orthodoxy playing devil's advocate, right? keeping us on our toes intellectually by thinking, playing devil's advocate, thinking of the best case that can be made for alternative views and so on. And in response, Mill says the following thing, roughly, I'm, all this is paraphrasing. Look, human nature being what it is, that's not good enough. Right? We find empirically that's not good enough. If you agree with me that it's important to have access to the best arguments that can be made on the other side of the case, then generally speaking, and all this being equal, you're going to get those kinds of arguments from people who believe, or at least genuinely open or genuinely sympathetic to the alternative point of view, as opposed to somebody who isn't, but is just playing devil's advocate. Now, on the one hand, I think Mill's right about that. On the other hand, look, I think it's just an empirical claim. Right? You'll get the better case made if you have this kind of environment rather than if you don't, but you've got people, smart people playing devil's advocate. Uh, so it's an empirical claim. I don't claim to have, I certainly haven't done any carefully controlled experiments or controlled studies or anything like that. Um, nevertheless, I think it's right. Why do I think that? To be honest, just largely based on my own experience. Uh, I've spent basically my entire adult life, so 22 of the last 23 years, either at this university or at Harvard University. And to be honest, and I certainly don't exempt myself from what I'm about to say, I've not been, over, I've not been overwhelmed by how often scholars at either school seem to be bending over backwards to make the strongest case against some view that they hold and they published. Uh, they published. So I guess there are really two issues here. One is, how good would people be at playing devil's advocate if they were completely committed, deeply invested in doing that. And the other is, how likely is it that people are going to be deeply invested and committed to coming, playing devil's advocate in this way? And I think you have to be optimistic about both of those things in order to make the devil's advocate response work. So count me skeptical, I think there's no substitute for an environment that's hospitable to genuine dissent. I think there's lots of other reasons for thinking that, other than the ones I just, these kind of broadly million considerations I just rehearsed, but I don't want to take up too much time because uh, Will's got, going to take the floor and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Well, let me just say, well, deal with the media or expose myself or my family to any character assassination campaigns from vile leftists or deal with the deep state operatives. I don't even pick up the phone anymore. I do have tenure at XX University now, but there's still opportunities ahead that this would shut the door to, not to mention irritating fellow liberal colleagues. Well, this is a young scientist, very good one, you know, he'll be a member of the Academy of Sciences one of these days, uh, 
And, and this is the situation he finds himself in at a very distinguished university. Um, okay, so what, what's the issue? I'm going to take 10 minutes and tell you a little bit of science. You know, if you're out there talking about science, you ought to know some science. You know, that uh, helps. Look, okay, so we're talking about CO2. CO2, this room is full of CO2. You're full of CO2. Your lungs are full of CO2. This so-called pollutant. It's a molecule with three atoms. There's a black carbon atom in the middle and two red oxygens in this depiction. And this thing can ring a little bit like a xylophone bar. And the, the bending mode, the xylophone mode in the middle, is uh, able to absorb thermal radiation from the Earth. And so it makes it a little harder for the Earth to cool, uh, emitting radiation into space. So, for sure, CO2 is a greenhouse molecule uh, that's been known for uh, since 1860 or so when John Tyndall first discovered this. And so there's no question about that. Okay, now, is there a problem from increasing CO2? CO2 is increasing, nobody disputes that. Probably some of the increase is uh, from fossil fuels, maybe most of it. But, you know, the current CO2 levels are actually quite low by geological standards. I don't know how many people here know that, but this is a plot. This is from Bob Berner, Professor Berner, the late Professor Berner at Yale. Some of you probably know him, I knew him. And this is his estimate based on proxy records of past CO2 levels. And this starts uh, at a 550 million years ago, the beginning of the Phanerozoic, you know, the Cambrian, when you first began to get good fossils. And uh, you can see that the relative amount of CO2 plotted on the vertical scale has typically been five times, ten times more than it is today. Today is the extreme right, it's marked today. So over most of geological history, CO2 levels have been much higher than now, much higher than now. And yet, you know, we, we hear, uh, you know, carbon pollution, you know, uh, carbon footprint, you know, you know, save the planet. And you, if the planet needs anything, it's more CO2. And uh, these low levels of CO2 are having a serious negative effect on plants. Let me come back to this pollutant. Uh, every one of us here is emitting CO2. Uh, there's a young woman breathing on it chilly day and so her breath is condensing just like the uh, output of these cooling towers at a power plant and a well scrub power plant and I've been to some of them you, you should visit one someday uh, what comes out of the sack is not very different from what comes out of your own mouth you know there are uh, a series of uh, emission controls that strip out real pollutants you really do make pollutants when you burn coal or oil, nox, nitric oxides, sulfur oxides, uh, you know, fly ash, you can get rid of those, uh, get them down to ambient levels. And under those conditions, you know, fossil fuel emissions are not very different from your own breath. They have a little less oxygen, you have more oxygen, and uh, you have a little more uh, water, and a little less CO2. We're made of carbon. Carbon is the second most abundant element by weight in our own bodies. You know, this so-called pollutant, you know, carbon pollution, you know, I'm looking in a room full of pollutants, you know. This is, uh, in fact, this is one of the most dangerous things because if you talk to people who are really pushing this, you know, many of them will tell you there are too many people, you know, there are eight, seven billion people, you know, there really should be one billion, less than one billion. Okay, so, they get into power. Well, who decides which six out of seven of us uh, vacates the planet? You know, is that really uh, a philosophy we want? But some of them want that. Okay, so what, what is the supposed danger? It's uh, supposedly we're going to fry from increasing CO2. The answer is no, we're not. This is completely wrong. So let's talk a little bit about science, this is not a course in climate, but 
you know, roughly speaking, this, this is a NASA view graph, so it must be right. Uh, it actually is pretty good. It shows that the Earth is kept warm mostly by sunlight. We get a tiny amount of heat from under our feet coming up from the interior of the Earth, but it's trivial, so if the sun weren't shining, we would freeze. And that heat has to go back into space, otherwise the Earth would continually get hotter. It, so it comes in as visible light that you can see out there today, and it goes out as infrared, which you can't see, but you know you can feel uh, as a thermal radiation. So supposedly CO2 is going to seriously upset this balance, and cause intolerable warming of the Earth, even though, as I just showed you, over most of the history of the Earth, CO2 levels have been five times, ten times of what they are now, and the Earth was fine. You know, life flourished, you know, look at the fossil record. That's, where did all the oxygen come from? It came from that period, or all the carbon. Well, uh, it's a little more complicated than just radiation. Uh, the Earth uh, is heated mostly near the equator. That's where the sun is coming down most nearly vertically during the day. So it uh, uh, deposits most of its heat in uh, low latitudes uh, in the tropics. Much of that heat is carried northward and southward by big convection currents. Uh, this is a greatly simplified picture, but it gets the basic idea right. And so, the, you know, if you really want to understand what happens when you add more CO2, you have to figure out the details of this picture and uh, uh, say what happens if you double CO2 or quadruple CO2. Well, there's no doubt that CO2 uh, limits the amount of radiation coming out of the Earth. This is actual observational data from a satellite looking down at the Earth. and. What I plotted here is the vertical axis is the heat radiation coming from the Earth, uh, and the horizontal axis is the frequency, sort of the color of the radiation coming out there. You know, the radi thermal radiation is colored just like physical radiation can be colored. And what you can see here is that it's quite <coughs> different depending you know, on whether you're uh, in the Sahara Desert or the Mediterranean or the South Pole. But, uh, that you can see a uh, a gap here in the spectrum, and this is CO2. So there's a somewhat less radiation coming out than there would be if there were no CO2. Of course, by far the most important gaps are caused by water. So on the extreme left is water, which is there even over the Sahara Desert, and at the extreme right, right there's water. So uh, you know, CO2 is certainly not trivial, but it, it's second uh, string compared to water vapor. You can see actually over the South Pole there's practically no water vapor. That's why my colleagues like to go and observe at the South Pole to get rid of the water vapor uh, interference. And, and CO2 in the South Pole is actually coming out in emission. Okay, let me hurry. CO2 is increasing. I already mentioned that. Everybody knows it's, it's about two parts per million per year. So. We're approaching 400 parts per million, and we're probably a little more than that today, averaged over the Earth. There's more CO2 in the North than in the South, uh, depending on the time of year. Uh, but the, the take, uh, an important takeaway message is that attempts to model the warming from CO2 are not working. So the red curve here is the average of IPCC warming models for the lower troposphere. And the green and the blue curves are what's being observed. So, you know, the, the thing that grips my attention and people who think like me is that the models don't work. They're not even close to working. Every year they get worse. So, you know, all of the policy, all of the alarm is based on that red curve which does not agree does not agree with observations. It's, you might think, well, okay, who did this? This is a, uh, the same, uh, uh, this is the same information from nature, you know, it must be right, you know, nature's the best magazine there is, they think. You know, I even predicted the warming in 1982, I wrote, was a co-author of one of the first books on effects of CO2. 
you know, I overestimated it too. So I'm, I'm at least as surprised as other people that it's turned out that the warming has been much less. Uh, okay, so, so the harm from warming is completely fabricated. It's not there. It's not going to be there. I mean, we already know that because the Earth survived at much higher CO2 levels. But it'll be a significant gain for agriculture. I, you know, uh, this audience will make me proud if at least one or two will tell me what crop this is. Uh, come on, come on. Don't, don't disappoint me. I, you know, I, I tell them, I, I showed this at Harvard and nobody, everybody thought it was marijuana. <laughs> beans. It's beans. Very good. It's soybeans. <laughs> good, okay. So, it's soybeans. Soybeans actually do very well when you add CO2 to them. You know, there, there's a problem with uh, photosynthesis that goes back to a design flaw, you know, three and a half billion years ago. So the most abundant protein in the world is this protein that's sketched here, and it's called Rubisco. This protein uh, is designed to be primed with ATP from uh, photosynthesis from the chloroplast, and then to grab a CO2 molecule, you can see one up there on the right, attach it to water and to another sugar molecule, and so grow a carbohydrate. And uh, it works perfectly if it's in pure CO2, but if you start adding oxygen, and that wasn't really an issue when it was designed because three and a half billion years ago there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, but now there's a lot of oxygen. The oxygen can be used instead of a CO2, so most plants today are operating about, at best, 75% efficiency with photosynthesis because there isn't enough CO2 for them to get, and instead of getting a CO2 from time to time to get an oxygen, it's called photorespiration. And that's why greenhouse operators routinely add more CO2. You get much better performance in a greenhouse. Uh, because you suppress photorespiration, you get better flowers, better fruit. So that's one good thing about CO2. The other good thing about CO2 that uh, is probably even more important photo than photorespiration is that when plants are using CO2, at the same time a CO2 molecule diffuses in from the atmosphere, there's not much CO2 in the atmosphere, 400 parts per billion. Sounds like a lot, but it's parts per million, right? There's a lot more water vapor in the leaf, and so roughly 100 water molecules diffuse out of the leaf for every CO2 that comes in through those little holes, through the stomata. So if you add more CO2 to the, atm to the atmosphere, plants know what to do. They simply grow leaves with fewer holes in them, and so they need less water. So besides suppressing photorespiration, more CO2 makes plants more water efficient. And so this is actual measurements of various cereals, uh, fruits and veg vegetables, uh, what happens when you increase CO2. But on every experiment that's done, you find very significant increases in yields. In fact, a good, a non-trivial part of the increase in yield of agriculture in the last 40 years has probably been due to CO2. This is satellite pictures of uh, greening of the earth from more CO2 from Donahue in Australia. And you can see that the greening uh, is most pronounced at the edges of deserts. Look at the south of the Sahara, massive greening, the western United States, western India. And uh, so most of this greening is from better water use efficiency. Plants are growing better where there used to not be enough water. Uh, to make it. Well, there are lots of scares. Sea level, sea levels are rising at about the same rate they always have. In fact, there's some unsettling information that they actually may be slowing the last 10 years. This is uh, tornadoes uh, versus year, you know, for 40 or 50 years. There's no, no trend. Snow cover, no trend. Hurricanes, no trend. Droughts, floods, no trend. So I'll close here with, since I'm here with a philosopher, I looked up a, a 
philosophical saying. This is Schopenhauer. I, I don't, he's sort of a curmudgeon, but uh, says uh, all truth passes through through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Secondly, it's violently opposed, and third, it's accepted as self-evident. So I think the truth that CO2 is not harmful, but is actually good for the planet, is somewhere between stages of ridicule and violent opposition. So I, I hope I live long enough to reach the third one. Thank you. from the audience, just in, in any order. Um, if you can be loud, because there's quite a bit of overflow. Um, yeah, so um, I'm a PhD student in atmospheric oceanic sciences, so I'm a climate scientist. And I personally don't agree with your arguments, but that's not what I want to talk about, because I feel like the issue at stake here is about intellectual diversity. So my question for you, and if Pop Kelly could also weigh in on this, is if Hypothetically, I had a time machine and could send you forward a couple centuries and show you that your arguments were wrong, hypothetically. What is the value of your dissent here today? Because I str personally strongly resonate with Pop Kelly's arguments about intellectual diversity. And I want to understand why this dissent in the climate scientist science realm is in fact useful. Is that, for, is that for me? That's for you. Okay. Does, does it make sense what I'm getting yeah, at? Yeah, I, I think I understand. Well, okay. First of all, uh, policies to address this, you know, non-pollutant CO2 are not free. You know, and they're particularly damaging to poor people. You know, they're damaging to the third world, which desperately needs electrical power. The only way that they will get that quickly and efficiently is with fossil fuels, with coal. And so you can't get a loan to build a power plant. So if you go to Africa now, there are a lot of power plants going up. They're all coal and they're all built by the Chinese. And thank God for the Chinese for doing that. Uh, the second thing is, I, I think, uh, you know, this has been very, very uh, harmful to integrity of uh, the integrity of academia and science. You know, when I get letters like the one I showed from a young man who was afraid to speak out, who knows perfectly well that, it, you know, what he would like to say was just afraid to say, that, that's a bad situation. <coughs> I mean, he's right, you know, if he were to speak out, he would never get elected to the academy. And, uh, so I, 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 th I think uh, it is doing a lot of harm. And, it, you know, I'm not against climate science, you know, I repeatedly say, I think climate is important, you know, climate has been important, you know, as long as history has existed, you know, Joseph went to Egypt because it was a long-term drought in Palestine, you know, uh, so it'd be nice if you knew that was coming, you know, years in advance so you could get ready for it, and, you know, we have periodic change, the California's just been flooded, you know, and, had a few dry years before then. If you look back over history, uh, California ain't seen nothing yet compared to what's happened in the past. So why don't we try to honestly understand that? Whatever happened in the past had nothing to do with CO2, but it was very, very uh, dramatic, you know, 100 year droughts. So this is important stuff, you know, and uh, I, I applaud those who are trying to understand it. But, you know, it's been reduced now to just a single demonized molecule, you know, vilify CO2, you know, and demonization of anything. Uh, industry has always been a bad thing. But you're not addressing her question, though. Yeah, so my question more is, well, I think you sort of did when you were talking about academic integrity, but I guess maybe this is where I also want Prop Kelly to weigh in on this. Is yeah, so you're asking a tough question, which is like, uh, tough, tough, asking, tough question, ask the true believer, which is, yeah. assume you're wrong. Now, what was the value of you saying this? What he's thinking that, you know, I think what it is, it's hard to answer that question, is what he's thinking, the, val the real value of what I'm, the true believer is always going to say, the real value of what I'm doing is telling the truth. But your question, I take it, I mean, I don't know, know enough of the science to really give a good answer. The kind of answer Mill would try to give, would think is appropriate in this uh, uh, context would be, if people who are pointing to, putting pressure on, pointing to weaknesses in existing models, uh, by doing that, 
lead to improvements in the model, even if um, the, the, the model wasn't as bad, the existing models wasn't as bad as they were claiming. That would be the potential kind of benefit. Now, how to make this, you know, in this particular case, I don't know enough of the relevant um, science. That's the kind of thing uh, Mill had in mind, I take it. Yes, I have a, a definitional question. A, a person who has tenure at a fancy university and has strongly held beliefs. You speak up now. The, the person who has tenure at fancy university and has strongly held beliefs, who is not sharing them with the public because they want to get elected to the academy, are they cowards or liars? Well, I was that way, so I guess I was a coward. I don't know if I was a liar, but I, I never expressed any doubt about climate change. No, but not you, elected. but you are definitely not a coward. But are, isn't this why we it, have a system where we can say what we want to say without fear of repercussion? This person isn't going to get fired. Yeah, so tenure is a great thing, and I think I don't know that much sympathy when academic, you know, tenured academics compare themselves to dis dissidents in uh, some totalitarian country where they're going to come, up, come after you physically. Or, I mean, there are cases where people, but so generally speaking, your they're not going to you know, go after your family. This person has an obligation so, to speak out. That might be true, uh, but, um, but I also think, I mean, part of my thought following Mill and Orwell and these people is um, most of us are cowards. Right? The average person, I mean, coward might be strong, right? But um, uh, if you are thinking about it from an institutional perspective, if you want vigorous dissent, um, uh, it's good, you know, even if it's not a matter of losing your job, there are all kinds of ways of making your life uncomfortable. But, but short if of you're that. devoting your life to science, you should say what you think is right, right? And, and the system protects people who do that because they cannot get fired for it. I mean, it's a little bit, uh, it, I'm very pro-tenure, I agree with you, that, uh, but I think you're a little bit reductionistic about um, job security versus not job security, the only thing here. I mean, there's ways of putting pressure on people short of taking away their job, I think. But will, as a matter of fact, right or wrong, you're saying it shouldn't be like that. People shouldn't <coughs> care about these other things. As a matter of fact, empirically, the average person is going to care about, you know, not getting a certain, amount, a certain level of hostility. Yes, sir. Okay. So my question is for Professor Hacker, and it's basically, are you 100% sure the models are wrong? Because to me, even if there's a 10% chance they're right, the potential damage is so catastrophic that that would still merit large efforts to remediate climate change. So what do you feel about, you know, maybe the models are probably wrong, but it could be so bad that, you know, the chance that they are right is worth going through that effort. No, no, I, I, that's a good question, but I, I think the uh, the fact that convinces me that that's not an issue is the geological record. Because we have very, very good geological evidence for much higher CO2 levels, and, and the Earth was fine. So you're 100% sure? <laughs> yes, yes. All the way in the back against the wall. So you mentioned the geological record, and while I have no doubt that the, the planet and the flora on the planet would be able to adapt to higher levels of CO2, the last time levels of CO2 were at the levels they are now was about three to five billion years ago. Um, and the last time they reached a thousand parts per million, the Earth's surface level temperature was 10 degrees warmer than it currently is now. So I'm curious, and I'm, I'm looking at the, the National Academy of Sciences report on climate change for the stats, so I'm curious why your confident that even if CO2 levels were as high as they have been in the past, that humans would be able to adapt sufficiently as plants would be? Well, first of all, if you, if you look carefully at the record, the temperature is not that well correlated with uh, CO2. You know, there were major glaciations in the Ordovician. You know, you can see evidence all over the world. Uh, those CO2 levels were, you know, Two or three thousand parts per million. So, uh, and you can also look at what's happening now. You know, CO2 levels are going up. Temperature is going up much more slowly than the models predict. And nobody knows more about how CO2 interacts with radiation than I do. You know, I've spent my life working on CO2 lasers and absorption in the atmosphere. I dare say I know as much as you know most people in this university, and much of it was classified at the time. And, you know, CO2 is not a very good absorber. It's, uh, 
when, when you get more CO2, you simply broaden the wings a little bit. You, you don't make much difference in the center of the line that I was showing you there. So anyway, it's a good question, but we maybe should do this off, offline. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Yeah. Gentlemen, again. <laughs> So I'm going to change the direction just a little bit. So it's mostly uh, to either one of you because you're both professors. Um, so, you know, in my view, I guess I romanticized, or when I was like back in Mississippi, I romanticized Princeton as a place where, you know, you're looking for academic uh, experiences to expand your mind. And so I'm very much in agreement of like having academic diversity. Now, I would also say that I was kind of disappointed a little bit in Princeton, and I'm wondering, uh, what do you feel like is the role of the faculty and administration? Because, uh, and like increasing academic diversity in the sense of the way people think about stuff. Because what I've seen is people yelling at each other, uh, whether it's be administrators or faculty, uh, towards you know teenagers and teenagers. Well, you know, the teenagers. I'm right now. I'm 30 years old, so um, you know I've worked in the military and all kinds of stuff. But the point is, is that again, as an institution that like pride itself like creating these scholars, um, you know, knowing that professors tend to be very good at the research. And when it comes to things like, you know, men uh, mentorship, I would say they're maybe incredulous at best on like the way that uh, really approach that. What do you feel like is the faculty role since you have the most interaction with the student? And also, what do you think the administration's role is in trying to nurture an area where people can be open uh, to this academic diversity? Uh, <coughs> let me ask a quick question back to you. Yeah. You've been disappointed in Princeton in what respect? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, specifically uh, in the way that arguments are conducted. So, you know, whether you're on conservative or liberal side, uh, at this point I'm kind of disgusted in either side, not just at Princeton, but overall, but in the sense of like, you know, people that have extreme views, whether it's, um, you know, about racial issues or, or whatever, or maybe it's some kind of research study or something like, you know, pro environment or something. The, the point is that, you know, when I see these arguments happening in like these kind of scenarios, instead of having like critical debate about like, you know, trying to get inside someone's mind to understand what they're thinking, it's more like I have a stance, you have a stance. And the thing is, I wouldn't mind this from the students because, again, they're just being, sorry undergrads, <laughs> being leaned off the bottom. So they don't know any better. But faculty, as you know, older, more experienced people, administration, people as the leaders, um, you know, of the university in the sense of like, you know, how things are conducted. How do you feel like, where do you think their role is in trying to help these, you know, students or us to be able to engage? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess there is a possibility. I, I would like to see us do more of, um, uh, and you don't want to become kind of a circus type atmosphere, but really bringing together people who think differently about some issue. and trying to do some kind of format where they really are forced to engage with one another and go back and forth. I mean, often there is, you know, there's like the Madison program people over there, and there's you know, different wings, and sometimes I do have a feeling, but occasionally when I speak to groups, I do have a feeling that, uh, and I think this is not an example of this, but I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir or something like that, right? Uh, so um, I think there should be more events where people are invited on the understanding that we want you to represent this kind of view, and we are, we are uh, inviting somebody who holds we think of the person as holding the opposite uh, point of view. We'd like you to try to set a model for the students in terms of the way um, you engage with one another. Um, how to get people to do a better job of this, I'm not really sure. Um, I take as much responsibility as anybody else in my colleagues. But I share your sense that it should be better um, than it is. I think, I mean, there's a comparative question, how well Princeton does compared to other universities and colleges, and there my sense is, Maybe we're not doing so badly, at least. I mean, it's hard, because I'm here and not there. But I do hear stories and so on that um, in some ways it might be worse other places than it is here. And I think in some ways, uh, President Eisgruber's done a pretty good job, uh, statements he's made and so on. That's, contra that's controversial, anything will be controversial. But, um, so I think it could be worse, but it could be a lot better. And I don't have any uh, great solutions for how we can make it better. I think redouble our efforts, and I'll try to do that for my part. But thanks, for this one, we're satisfied. I'll, I'll add one small thing, though I don't have tenure. Um, <laughs> there, there was an incident that was widely publicized in the news this week that uh, Dr. Charles Murray, who has his own controversial track record, a sociologist who's done race-specific um, research as well, um, spoke at Middlebury. And at some point, the disruptions went on long enough that the campus safety decided the best thing to do was to usher him off campus into a car and move him away. Um, and students not only protested the talk, 
They then blockaded the car, and as a professor who didn't agree with him but was, was there for the talk, was trying to escort him to the car, she suffered damage to her neck and facial muscles as protesters pulled at her hair. They banged on the car, uh, and the, Dr. Murray genuinely feared for his life. I think all things considered, things here are, are, are pretty good, but in cases like that, um, it's important that there has to be accountability and responsibility for people who shut down that kind of speech. Um, another thing in terms of the administration is bias reporting and things like that that have the potential to chill that discourse when students are afraid, just weaned off the bottle, but afraid to voice um, points of view that they've heard their whole lives but think maybe wouldn't be acceptable in the classroom. Um, and one of the things, I mean, this, this panel I was put together, I got emails from three different professors, of course, I mean, Professor Philander's in the back, he's a geoscience professor, I got an email from Professor Bryce, who's a free speech philosopher, They've been very public about what they believe on the topics they teach. There's no profession of objectivity and truth. And they make clear, this is what I believe. Here's how I'm going to teach and engage with me on this material. Um, I think the, the, the space where we get into trouble is when a professor says, this is the truth. It's going to be on the exam. And if you disagree with it, you know, points come off. Um, so maybe there's, there's some work to do there, but that's for these gentlemen. Um, yes? Uh, I have a question for Professor Haber. Um, <coughs> You, you allege uh, uh, and uh, of CO2 and uh, suppressing of, you know, opposing viewpoints. Uh, to what extent do you think, to what extent do you think that, uh, to what extent has, in your experience, has that come from climate scientists as opposed to random people on the internet, say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not sure I heard it right, but I, I, as I said before, I, I think there are many very, very good, honest climate scientists. And, you know, I especially, I've often said, I admire the ones who are actually out there measuring things. You know, that, that's the real stuff. But, you know, if they're doing good analysis, that's okay too. But there, there's another group of hangers on who are not scientists at all. You know, they're. You know, they, they feel like they've got a mission, you know, they're going to save the planet, you know, and they can't be bothered to try and learn any science, you know, but my goodness, that'd be too much work. But, you know, they're absolutely sure they're right, and, and so they, uh, you know, I often call them a cult, and they really are a cult. And uh, I would say, for example, you know, the, the 350.org, you know, it's very much like that. You know, what, what do they know about climate, you know? Uh, you can tell from the applause next door that it looks like we're running out of time. We want to be mindful of that. So if we can combine two questions from the back, uh, and then you're welcome to come and speak afterwards. I completely agree that um, sort of diverse opinions and healthy debate uh, is essential. But don't you think it's also important to publicly state your funding sources? Because that, that point of information could really, really help connect dots and really change the way you take in the information. So to have your funding sources publicly front and center along with the work you're doing for everyone. Don't you think that that's an important piece of information? And, and Betty, your question too. Maybe yes. Can we get both questions together? Them. Yeah, please. Well, yes, so we should stop doing it. Let's get both questions together so, and then we'll address So my, my question is, uh, so Professor Abbey, you, you put some nice examples, uh, anecdotes of people that feel that their career uh, would be threatened if they came out and presented evidence uh, that they think they have, uh, that the consensus is wrong. Uh, what I would put forth is, is my personal anecdote that in my career, the massive inflection point came when I, in uh, assessing the evidence for a hurricane connection to global warming, found some results that were very contrary to very public uh, assessments by the IPCC. Now, what I would find is that my career took off. Not only that, but uh, you could perhaps demonize the uh, IPCC and uh, the climate community, but in the reality of it is that my, the results that I found were assessed, they were included, they modified the conclusions of the report along with the, uh, with the, the course of science. So, so I think anecdote to anecdote, we could go forever, but my, my comment to everybody would be, if you find evidence that you can back up, Go ahead, stand up, don't be a coward. And it turns out that the field isn't filled up with cartoons. And sometimes uh, we embrace new ideas all the time. So this, I don't think we got forward by calling each other demons and uh, cults, but rather by having constructive engagement. 
Well, I think I already said that I admire the sort of work that you do. Uh, you're the sort of person I was thinking about, and I hope you keep it up, and, uh, and I hope we can support more of that. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I understood the, uh, the previous question. It had something to do with the sources. The fact that stating funding sources. Well, look, the, you know, I, I think the, the people with the highest conflict of interest by far are those who get government funding. And I, I speak with quite a bit of knowledge because I, I supervised that funding from 1990 to 1993. And I can tell you, if we didn't get proposals that looked <coughs> like it would be uh, kind of alarming if CO2 increased, they didn't get funded. And, uh, so the, gov the government has a very clear message, or at least it has had for a long, long time, that uh, it wants results that, that support the political narrative. And uh, that is a much, much more potent force than any other thing I can think of, you know. You know, the amount of support uh, on the other side from fossil fuels, for example, is peanuts. There's nothing there. I agree, but this is something we have to debate as much as we debate the facts, is the, the narrative of who, who, is, who is behind what, who has to gain from the narratives of these funds. I completely agree that, that no, side, no side is clean, but, but to have this conversation about where the money is coming from, what that means, the science itself is very important, and should be talked about as much as the facts we talk about. I'm Phil Dorman, David, the organizer, professor, the audience.